Hi, I'm Joseph Berardo. At MagnaCare, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chess Challenge, Steve and Elaine Pazicki, United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth, MagnaCare, and by Johnson & Johnson. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey and by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to One on One. I'm Steve Adubato. It is our pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nicholas Jarman, who is an orthopedic surgeon at Meridian Health. Good to see you. Thanks like for having me. Uh, your specialty is shoulders. Yes, it is. What's up with the shoulder, by the way? It's complicated, isn't it? Uh, it's a little complicated. Uh, a lot of yeah. pieces to it? Uh, a lot of moving parts and all in close proximity to each other. Now, you, uh, you do shoulder replacements. Yes. Wait a minute. I know about the hip replacement. I know about the knee replacement. Are there more shoulder replacements than there were 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, it's definitely becoming much more uh, common. Uh, you know, every year there's about 600,000 knees done, uh, 300,000 hips done, only about 60,000 shoulders done. But that's a dramatic increase from even 10 years ago. So it's certainly becoming a, a more popular surgery as uh, people are starting to learn more about it. Uh, there's more surgeons trained in it. Um, so it's certainly becoming uh, more and more common. You know, we don't walk on our hands, so it's never going to be like a hip or knee replacement where we're doing you know, 600,000 a year, but it's certainly becoming more, more common. What is it that people should be looking for? I mean, I was telling you before we got in the air, I won't go into detail about my shoulder surgeries. Um, but I mean, people have had shoulder surgeries, mm -hmm. but what would cause someone to be a candidate for a shoulder replacement? Uh, you know, the, really the only indication for a shoulder replacement is pain, you know, pain from our arthritic joint. Um, so as from our arthritic joint? Mm -hmm. As opposed to a rotator cuff issue, as opposed to a exactly, you know, as opposed uh, to a rotator cuff issue, or uh, I told you I had a frozen shoulder. shoulder. That's not exactly. you're not a candidate for, to get your shoulder replaced. Correct. A frozen shoulder. Uh, uh, Georgette just asked me, which means you can't move your arm. Exactly. Like, that's what happened to me. I couldn't move it past a certain point. Not a candidate. No. It's really for shoulder arthritis. Occasionally, there's certain types of fractures that we treat right. with uh, shoulder replacements, um, but for the most part, it's for uh, Arthritis, uh, painful arthritic shoulder joint. Okay, so is it a product of aging? Is this arthritis connected directly with aging, or have you seen it at all ages? It kind of, uh, we've seen it at multiple ages, and uh, you know, people always ask what causes it. Was it a type of exercise, lifestyle I led? Um, more often than not, I think it's a genetic disease. We see people that come to the office, they already had their hips done, their knees done, and then they come in for their shoulders. It's just part of, uh, in certain individuals, unfortunately, it's part of their particular aging process. What are the things, well, first of all, you brought some visuals in here. Can we get a shot of this, guys, team? Steve, can you get a shot of it? Okay, describe it. What are we so looking at? So we have at? two models. Uh, this first one here, this is called a, a standard or an anatomic shoulder replacement. This is what the vast majority of the shoulder placements will be. And it's just replacing uh, the normal ball and socket. We have a metal ball here um, and then a, a plastic socket, similar to a, uh, like you would have a hip replacement. Um, same idea. Um, the next model is uh, a newer type of design, only been available in the United States for about 10 years. It's called the reverse shoulder. The reverse shoulder? Yep. And that was really designed for people that have a specific type of arthritis called rotator cuff tear arthritis or cuff tear arthropathy. So these are individuals that have these huge massive rotator cuff tears that can't be fixed. And then over time they go on to develop arthritis because of that. And they um, require a sp specific type of shoulder replacement and that's the reverse. We also use that for elderly patients with pretty severe um, shoulder fractures that can't really be put together. Um, that's also, metal? Correct, that's metal uh, as well as a plastic. So you go in the airport, well. what happens? Uh, it might set it off. Really? Yeah, it might. Uh, so, you know, you show them your scar, they wand you, and they let you on through. 
But here's my question. As I look at this, I mean, this, this feels pretty heavy, right? Plus mm -hmm. you got the metal here, right? Describe the healing process once you have the replacement, but also the physical therapy part of it. I'm curious about that. Okay. Um, so the healing process really entails letting the rotator cuff heal after the surgery. As we do the surgery, uh, we make an incision in the front of the shoulder. And we actually have to cut one of the tendons of the rotator cuff to, to get inside the joint and do all our work. Afterwards, we repair that rotator cuff. And then the rehab is really based upon letting that rotator cuff heal. So it's basically the same rehab as someone that has rotator cuff repair surgery. The components, the ball and socket, are, are solidly fixed at the time of surgery. So how long are we talking? Uh, usually keep people in a sling for about six to eight weeks. Right. Um, so my, you, you, you immobilize it? Uh, yeah, for the most part. My, six to eight weeks? Yeah. My particular protocol, I start people on what we call passive range of motion. So just using your other arm to lift it, move it in space for about four weeks. And then we advance to what we call an active assisted. So um, kind of walking their, wall, their arm up the wall, um, doing what we call table slide, just moving yep. across the table to kind of work on building some gentle strengthening. Sure. Then at that six to eight week mark, we come out of the sling and start to use the arm as they normally would with the caveat they're not doing any heavy lifting. Then at about the three month mark, let them start working with some weights. Are athletes, a certain kind of athletes, who do certain kinds of things, I'm thinking pitchers and baseball, are they more likely to have these kinds of problems? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Is the overhead athlete more likely to develop a shoulder arthritis? And generally, I would say no. Um, they're certainly, they're more apt to have shoulder issues, labral tears, rotator cuff issues. But to develop shoulder arthritis, not so much. And it really gets back to it. We really think a lot of it's just a, a genetic process. You're just a kind of born process? that way. You're yeah, born you're just with born shoulders with, that... You're born with bad cartilage, and it wears out, and you get arthritis. Really? Yeah. And you've seen a lot of ball players. What's your connection? I'm a Yankee fan, so I mean, I heard you had a connection to the Baltimore Orioles. Yes. Well, what did you do for these guys? Uh, during my fellowship, uh, one component of it, we were the team physician for the Baltimore Orioles. So for uh, two seasons, I was uh, one of the uh, physicians for the Baltimore Orioles, which was uh, which was a great experience. You know, covering the games, um, you know, going down to spring training, getting out of Baltimore on a snowy February day to go uh, do a couple physicals and. But Fine. you love the Yankees. I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so real quick, before I let you out of here, give me something about the Orioles this year. I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. Come, what you, come, that's it? I'm two years out. I don't have the inside track anymore. You don't have the inside track? Okay. Um, for those who are skeptical or cautious, and I say, well, the knee, I get, right? I understand that um, because it's very common, the hip. I get it's very common. Is this going to become more common as time goes on because more and more people are going to have serious problems and real pain that's persistent and chronic? I, I certainly think it will. Um, you know, one of the issues I constantly encounter with the shoulder replacement is that people don't know about it. Everyone knows someone that had a hip or a knee done and they see how great they do and they, um, they want to you know, go ahead with it. The shoulder replacements, not many people know anyone that's even had a shoulder replacement. Some people don't even know it's an option. Um, uh, but as the surgery becomes more common, I think it'll kind of beget more people go wanting to have the surgery. You mean as they people know other people who have it? Yeah, because they'll see how well they do. It, it's a, it, the pain relief is amazing, um, and it's uh, almost immediate. Usually I see people uh, a week after their surgery, um, and you know, 90% of the time they say they have no pain. What's that they, like for you? They take a Tylenol to go to bed. It's my favorite surgery to do by far. People are so happy afterwards. Um, it's far and away my favorite surgery to do. Best patient response. Well, uh, making a difference in people's lives is a big deal. Dr. Nicholas Jarman, orthopedic surgeon, Meridian Health. I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Good stuff. Stay right there. Um, he's really at his heart a Yankee fan. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are here with uh, Posse Salberg, who is um, a keynote speaker here at the NJA convention. He's the author of Finnish Lessons, What Can the World Learn from Educational Change in Finland? It is an honor to have you. How are you liking Atlantic City so far? Well, this is my first time in this city, and uh, I came here last night, so I saw all the lights. 
Um, it looks beautiful. I, I haven't seen the boardwalk that everybody everybody's talking about, but I, I'm enjoying my time. Well, it's an honor to have you here with us at the NJA convention. Um, Pasi has been speaking about, it was spoke today, this morning, to thousands of NJA conventioners about Finnish education. I have to ask you, at the core, what would you say some of the most significant Finnish lessons are that the rest of us need to learn about education? I think probably on the top of my, my head is the, the, the importance of equity in education. And this, people often misunderstand what equity means. In Finland it means that we, we want to have a school system that is good and great for everybody, every child. So we, we try to design the school system so that uh, particularly those children who come from homes where the, uh, the circumstances and situations are not so favorable for learning would have an opportunity to be successful in the school. And these school systems look very different compared to many of the schools for uh, school systems here in the United States where the excellence and quality seems to be driving uh, driving the work of the school, so I think this equity in in, um, uh, in education is one of those uh, one of those things. And, and and secondly, obviously the how do we define teaching profession? How do how do we how do, how do we understand the the work of teachers? How's it different? Well, in Finland we we. Um, we perceive our teachers a little bit like you do your medical doctors and lawyers in terms of providing them a high quality academic research based education. We are not allowing any alternative pathways, training programs into teaching. There's only one academic university based pro program just like you have your, for your medical doctors and lawyers. And that's why I think we probably have much more professional unity in Finland among our teachers and educational leaders than you have here in America. But there's more than that. I mean, as I read about your work, you also say that there's an issue about testing. Talk about this and the differences in terms of, in Finland, how student testing is, plays out and how it's perceived, how you perceive it to be played out in the United States. Yeah, this is a common question about the, uh, the student assessment and standardized testing, particularly in my country. I'm often telling people that we are not having standardized testing uh, at all, actually. We, we only have one standardized examination at the very end of the high school when our students are already 18 or 19 years old. So the question is that, so how do we, how do we assess, evaluate what the students are doing? How do you? Well, we, we trust our teachers uh, pretty much, just like you trust your, most of your medical doctors and some of your lawyers, that you don't go and, and question the quality of their work. So we trust that the teachers are the best people who are able to tell and report how the kids are learning. And then we have the, we have the sample-based way of reporting and answering our, our legislators, our members of the parliament, when they want to know whether the taxpayers' money is well, well spent. So it's just a little bit like your NAEP, your national assessments here in the, in the United States, where we take samples of schools and, and kids and then evaluate those things. You know, I can tell you one thing that makes me always uh, kind of a surprise here in, in your great country, and it is that how central place standardized testing has uh, has uh, been given and, and, and uh, that, that, that it is right now in the, in the United States. What's the downside of that policy? Uh, there are many, many downsides there. I, I think the, probably the most, most critical one is that it's really taking uh, too much time away from children from learning and too much time from uh, teachers to teach. I hear when I, when I walk around this convention here, people tell me that they spend up to one third of the school year on teaching uh, the, the testing or testing related um, issues here. And I think just a, just a stupid that you, uh, you, 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 you are spending so much time on collecting data and testing kids when they should be learning something. In Finland, um, on the other hand, we are spending no time for standardized testing so we can spend we can allocate this 100% of the the schedule that we have for teachers and students to learning things but just think about if you if if you lose one third of your school year for something that has nothing or very little to do with learning there's it's no wonder that the uh, the the learning outcomes and achievement is not at the level where where you want it to be I want to follow up on that uh, what evidence is there that students in Finland later on achieve more, um, have more successful lives, their quality of their lives are better. Talk about that. Well, it's a great question. That how do we... How, how, do we how does one measure that? Yeah, well, and, you know, this gets back to the question of what is the purpose of education. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why, you know, because in Finland we do not believe that the main purpose of education is uh, to have high test scores and, and, uh, and, and, and measure the, the academic or part of the academic achievement only. I think uh, 
the, the purpose of education is to individual fulfillment, that people can be happy and discover who they are, what they want to do, and also in, in Finland that the, the whole nation, the public will benefit from education. That's why we call it a public education in Finland. But you know, if you, look, if you take a look at the, some of the other I, I, international indicators um, where Finland and America, United States and many other countries are taking part, for example, take a look at the happiness, how happy people are. Finland is uh, continuously scored as the one of the, the happiest uh, nations, uh, happiest people in the world. Or you may take a look at the economic competitiveness where United States and Finland are compared. Finland is, uh, has been continuously during the last 15 years one of the most economically competitive uh, nations. We, have, we are number one in innovation and technology uh, around the world. So I think these probably don't kind of suggest that this is all because of education. But they, they certainly speak about the, the kind of overall good performance that Finland has. And education certainly has a big role to play in that. You're not implying that those of us in New Jersey are not happy enough, are you? No, New Jersey <laughs> people seem to be very happy. We're different, right? You know, you're different, but you, you look like a happy folks. Yeah, a couple more minutes that we have here. I want to make sure we take advantage of this. At this convention, you see thousands of educators and others connected to the world of education. What do you sense about educators in this state from your time, not just as a keynote speaker, but just, you know, walking the floor of this convention hall? Well, you know, I see, I, I meet many people asking questions, and, and they probably ask questions when, I, when they know that I come from a very different, different culture. And, um, you know, many people are asking, is there any hope here? Is there? Is, is there any hope? Yeah, there, I, I, you know. We want to know, is there? No, I think you have more hope than any other country other than Finland has in, in, in education. Because, you, you know, many of these ideas that we have used, or Canadians have used, or Singaporeans or Chinese have used when they have be, been building these school systems and education systems that are now out, outperforming the United States, are American ideas. Amer well, hold on. You're, Posse's saying that a lot of the things that are working in Finland were our ideas to begin with? No, you know, I'm, I'm not only saying that, but I'm saying that if you, want, if you don't believe that the American educational innovations are good enough for America, just come and see Finland, and I can show you how American ideas and education, uh, innovation in education work in a large scale. So, you know, that's where the hope comes from, that you have all these elements, you have all these ideas, you even have all these people and research in this country that can make your education system perform much, much better than it does. So that's what, you know, if you haven't, if you were depending on I, educational ideas and innovations and methods and models, just like we had been, or Singaporeans had been uh, during the course of the last uh, 20, 30 years, then you would be in trouble. But you have everything here. And you have the money, you have the resources here that you spend in education. Uh, you already spend more e in education than we do, or many other countries do. So, you know, if you, have, if you were poor, that you had the problem was that you don't have money to do these things. Then you, I think, then we would be speaking about lack of hope and a problem. You have, you guys, you have everything here. Just you got great people too. Yeah, you have great people, and you have this, you know, the thing that we do not have. America has this can-do mentality. That if you really want to do, if you want to send a man to the moon, you can do that. If you want to change the, the school system and thinking how people think about education and public education, you can do that. So now the question is. Are your politicians and uh, authorities and those people who have the power able to do, change the way they think? That I don't know. Thank you so much, Pasi. You honor us by your, uh, your speech, your time, and your commitment to education. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. Mario Finkelstein is an addiction psychiatrist. Let's talk about addiction uh, as an illness. Is it an illness as opposed to a cho some sort of lifestyle choice people have? Clarify, an illness. <clears throat> well, uh, we have come a long way in trying to um, identify addiction as an illness. And there is absolutely no question that uh, we are uh, dealing with uh, one of the most severe uh, brain illnesses, lethal brain illnesses. Essentially, uh, the whole process of the addiction is when the drugs or the alcohol uh, modify the brain circuits to the point that uh, the individual um, starts uh, living in a way that is totally out of his control, 
uh, and uh, the brain circuits have been uh, changed and uh, probably forever. Mm. Doctor, I'm curious about this. Um, some people become addicted to prescription pain medication. How do you differentiate that from what you just described? Say someone, um, we just had a physician in here who was talking about um, pain, chronic pain. Someone <clears throat> gets a prescription for a certain medication to deal with their pain. They get addicted to that pain medication. Is that different from what you just described? It's, it's, it, that's an excellent question. I, I think it's, uh, it's very important that the addiction person be able to make that distinction. Essentially, when we talk about addiction, we're talking about a host of behaviors, a host of attitudes, a host of complications that uh, will contribute to the diagnosis of the addiction. Uh, for and, example? For example, <clears throat> there are uh, behaviors in which the, individual, uh, the individual's private personal life changes and their priorities change dramatically. Obtaining the drug obta uh, it becomes the primary uh, purpose of the day. Um, uh, this, as you can imagine, brings significant complications at the social, uh, in his social environment, in his professional environment. And in spite of all these complications, one of the characteristics of this illness is that it's out of control. So the, the individual is unable to stop by himself. Uh, and uh, they continue to use, in spite of the, in, in very risky situations while driving, Mm -hmm. while operating uh, machinery, they continue to um, uh, put themselves in, 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 in positions of high uh, level of risk. Uh, you know, I always use the example that nobody drinks themselves to cirrhosis of the liver because they want to. Nobody gets HIV because they want to. Nobody develops hepatitis C because they want to. Nobody dies of an overdose or drives under the influence because they want to. So one of the characteristics of the illness of addiction is the loss of control mm. and uh, due to the effects of the drugs or the alcohol on the brain. On the other hand... By the way, as you're speaking, doctor, we're putting up important information about websites and organizations that we have partnered with for you to get additional information about what the doctor's talking about. I'm sorry, doctor, pick it up. The, the point that you brought up in terms of individuals being prescribed medications, for instance, for chronic pain or for cancer pain, uh, being prescribed narcotics, first of all, these, in, these medications are being prescribed. There is, a legitimate, there is a legitimate purpose for the prescription of this medication. And it is very possible that that individual taking for a prolonged period of time, those medications will develop some symptoms of tolerance and some symptoms of withdrawal mm -hmm. if they manage to stop. Those are two very important symptoms, but in an individual who has the illness of addiction, they are part of the definition. In an individual who's taking a legitimate medication for a legitimate purpose by itself, right. they do not describe addiction by any means. The patient may develop tolerance, the patient may develop withdrawal symptoms when they stop the medication, but by definition, that's not an addiction. I want to be clear on something. The New Jersey Prescription Monitoring Program is a powerful tool to help physicians do what? It's a powerful tool. First of all, it, we're talking about, we need to clarify this issue because very often it's it's uh, misunderstood. We're talking about patient's safety. Well, what is it? So a, a patient goes and tries to get a certain kind of drug um, from a physician. And that physician, through this program, this monitoring program, does what? You have access through your computer to this website in which uh, there is uh, very important information about uh, this uh, individual. You enter his information, and then you get information about what medications particularly narcotics uh, he's taking, uh, mostly narcotics or, or what we call controlled dangerous That's substances. That's what we're concerned about, controlled dangerous, dangerous substances. substances. Go ahead. The ones that this individual is taking, who, who is prescribing them, what is the amount, and who is dispensing this medication. What the history is. What the history is. And shouldn't this help the physician deal appropriately with that patient? It helps the physician deal appropriately because you can identify 
uh, if this individual's safety is at risk because he's obtaining uh, medications from different providers, but also can identify providers who are not practicing according to the standards. Well, shouldn't every physician be using it? Every physician should be involved in, in is this every are, are most physicians using it? My, the last statistics that I reviewed were that about 40 to 50 percent of the physicians and pharmacies were involved. Uh, it's it, not it, enough, so, is it, doctor? So far, so far it has been voluntary. We, the practitioners, have been encouraged to participate in this program. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not sufficient. It's not, is it? It is not. We need to do more? And the program, it also has its drawbacks. It's not 100 percent. Well, we need to improve it, Absolutely. but we need greater participation. Absolutely. And this addiction issue affects all of us. Um, and I want to thank you, Dr. Uh, Fickelstein, who is an addiction uh, psychiatrist. We also had the websites of our colleagues and friends who are working on this issue every day. I want to thank you very much, Doctor, for joining us and shedding important light on addiction and letting people know it is a serious illness. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chess Challenge, Steve and Elaine Pozicki, United Water, MagnaCare, and by Johnson & Johnson. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Each year, Americans fill 4 billion prescriptions, but as much as one-third of that medication will never be used. Some of this waste ends up in the rivers, lakes, and streams that make up our drinking water supply. The United Water Foundation and the National Community Pharmacists Association have partnered to bring you a simple solution. Dispose your meds responsibly. Go to disposemymeds.org to find a participating pharmacy and to learn more. A public service message from the United Water Foundation and NCPA.